Hello, dear friends. It's a pleasure to meet you as we reflect upon the Word of God. We are reflecting during this uh, day on a very important subject, the shepherd's crucible. I may need to define what is a crucible. A crucible is used in a laboratory. This is where we burn materials, we burn them on a crucible. And this is where we are able to subject them to extreme heat and the crucible itself becomes the medium where the objects that are being subjected to fire are placed upon this crucible. We are reflecting on the shepherd's crucible. And our text for reflection is Psalm 23, a very beautiful psalm. One of the most amazing pieces of literature that I invite you to go through almost as regularly as possible. Let's reflect upon it together. Psalm 23 from verse 1 to 6. This is a psalm of David. David writes this psalm and it is based on an agrarian or pastoral setting. This is a setting which is mainly in the countryside where people are heading sheep and the shepherd is heading his animals out there in the countryside looking at the valley where there is this setting where there are trees, there are mountains, and there are wild animals. This is the setting wherein David is presenting the power and the shepherdhood of God. The Psalm 23, as we read it, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Ye, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David promises that the Lord is a shepherd. This is a language that recurs constantly in the Bible, wherein God presents himself as a shepherd. As uh, you go to Isaiah 40, verse 11, God presents himself as this shepherd who will take the lambs upon his hands, lovingly take the lamb upon his own hand. And not only does he do that, 
He is also that shepherd in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 3, who takes those remnant of Israel as a shepherd. He gathers the remnant of Israel, brings them upon his hand. God is constantly referring himself to a shepherd. And not only does he refer himself to this shepherd, but he is the good shepherd. This writer, good, not just a shepherd. You know, there are shepherds who lose animals. You take them, they go and uh, take care of animals, they lose them, but I'll come to that, to, that, to that later. But he is the good shepherd. John 10, verse 14. He is this good shepherd. And not only is he a good shepherd, but he is also that shepherd who will gather together those who have been scattered. First Peter 2, verse, uh, verse 25. 1 Peter 2, verse 25. He is that shepherd who will gather together those who have been uh, scattered. And what does he also do? He is a good shepherd who leads people into paths of uh, righteousness for his name's sake. You see, this is uh, written in a very dangerous setting. If you go to Israel, this is an environment which has many hazards, mountainous, rocky, and uh, full of dangers. Anytime you have these flash floods, which just come anytime. And the essence of a shepherd is to guide his sheep, take them, protect them, lead them along the right path. Because this is very treacherous terrain, deadly terrain, where anything can happen to the sheep and the shepherd is necessary to protect this sheep, lead them along the right path. Not only does he do that, but he also prepares a table in the presence of the enemies and anoints his head with oil. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, when a visitor would come, the host would take the visitor and anoint his head with oil. This is a message that you are welcome. Come, let's dine together. You are my guest. I have welcomed you. I love you. You are part of my life. Enjoy. This was the freedom of the city, if we were to use current language. This was the freedom of the home. I am part of your life and enjoy to be with me. And uh, this is done in the presence of the enemies. And uh, he says, not only that, but goodness and mercy shall follow me. The word for follow, which is used there, is not just to follow, but it shall pursue and overtake me. It's not just following, it's uh, following with aggression, following with speed, following with agency. It shall pursue me. Quite very interesting, but I'll come to that. Let me now reflect upon these experiences. I've given you a background of uh, what is happening here. Now we come to what does this mean to me? We can talk about the shepherd and the anointing with oil. What does this mean to me? It has many meanings. It has 
a meaning at a spiritual level. What is the Lord saying to us? The Lord is my shepherd. Because he is my shepherd, I have a place where I can go. One of the most comforting things to a Christian is to know that there is a power that is higher than me, where I can go when there are challenges. Others don't believe there is a God, and they believe, therefore, they have to handle everything that confronts them by themselves. But I want to tell you, there are some things that we can never handle as human beings. Even atheists admit that there are things they cannot handle. And therefore, what is their option? Their option is just to crumble. But with us, we don't crumble. We have a shepherd. Not only a shepherd, but a good shepherd. Very, very good shepherd who takes care of our life. So roll your burdens away. Roll them to him. He cares about you. And not only does this apply at a spiritual level, but it applies as well at a very personal, very practical level. You see, uh, Abraham Maslow, wrote about the hierarchy of needs. He talked about uh, the basic needs that are at the lowest rung of Maslow's table. We need clothing. We need shelter. We need food. And what this is telling me as I read this, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. This is where there is food for the flock, where the flock can rest and eat. And not only are there green pastures, but there are also still waters to drink. He is a God who desires to give you some food to eat, to give you clothing, to give you shelter. God is concerned about those things. At times, when we talk to God, we don't want to express some of those deep longings that appear to be mundane, that, Lord, I need bread today. You are talking to the shepherd. The shepherd knows you need bread. Tell him you need bread. Tell him you are hungry. Even your deep emotional issues. You need a boyfriend. Yes, that is a need you want to marry. It doesn't mean that it will exactly happen as you desire. No, but he is willing to listen to you and give you what is best for your soul. If you need a partner to marry, tell him. And he is a God who knows who can be your best partner. But not only does he do that, he also leads you in paths of righteousness. Very exciting. Why are they called paths? of righteousness. This, at a very practical level, these are paths of righteousness. Why? Because they lead us to the right place. They lead us uh, to the right destination. When you travel in Africa, you are searching for Samantha's homestead, and you 
get off at the bus stop. As you get off at the bus stop, you are told that Sivanda's homestead, if you want to go to his homestead, follow this path. There is this other path. It will take you in that direction. Don't follow it. Follow this one. This is the path of righteousness. It is taking you to the right destination where there is the right person. Let's follow these paths of righteousness. The shepherd takes us in these paths of righteousness. They take you to the right place in many ways. In spiritual ways, they take you to heaven. But also in social ways, they take you to the right company. God gives you the right company. And uh, second, why are they called paths of righteousness? They are paths of righteousness because they give you the right company. The Lord himself is in your midst and uh, he is your partner and he is traveling with you and it's also a path of righteousness because they make you to be the right person. When you go with the shepherd, he will change you and make you to be the best person that you can be. And uh, as we get to the close of our discussion, when you get close to the good shepherd, to the Lord, the Lord will change you he will take care of you and make you to become the best person to live among enemies. There is no one, none of us who doesn't have enemies. We have various enemies. We have virtual and even virtual enemies these days. Those people who hate us because they have seen us on Facebook. They have never even met you, but they hate you on Facebook. And they hate you on WhatsApp. They have grown to hate you, but God will take care of you in the presence of those enemies. And what does this mean? It means God is in charge of your life. He is not a God that you pray to and say, please, God, can you revenge on my enemies? Can you do bad upon them? No. Go to Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Uh, you are not really praying for bad to happen to them, but it's a God who will do the best for you even among the people who hate you. And they will see good things happening to you not because God is fighting them, but because he is focusing on doing the best for you. At times, our problem is that we focus on enemies. Here, David is not focusing on the enemy. He is focusing on God. God is caring. God is love. He is not the subject of our attention. At times, we spend a lot of our energy focusing on those people who don't love us, who don't care about us, who are planning, plotting evil against us. But we are being reminded here that God will prepare a table. Let us focus on the table, on the goodies that our Lord has prepared in the presence of our enemies. As we come to the close, there are three things I want you to master from here. Point number one, remember you have a shepherd. Remember, you have a shepherd. What does this mean? It means 
things that are beyond your capacity have a shepherd to take care of. And what does the shepherd do? He is the one who has to fight the animals that are seeking to devour you, prowling animals that are seeking to destroy your life. You have a shepherd to take care of this. As shepherds, shepherds are the ones who hold the spear. Sheep are harmless. So as a harmless person, remember you have a shepherd to take care of you. Point number two, remember the shepherd has the best intentions about your life. He is not a God who will kill you. He is not inviting you in order to kill you. Ancient Near Eastern gods used to even eat their subjects or have uh, sexual intimacy with their subjects. This is not the kind of God who is seeking to have you in order to enjoy himself. He is not a narcissistic God. You know narcissism? People who have self-love, who love people for themselves. No, God is a God of love who loves giving out love, doing the best for you. God desires the best for your life. Point Number three, that you need to recognize from today is God allows you to enjoy this life even when there are people who don't love you. At times we are paralyzed when we think of people who don't like us. This is what we are being reminded, that we have a shepherd. When we have this shepherd, we can rejoice even when there are people who don't like us. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your energy seeking to get even with your enemies. Your duty is to focus on the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Shall we pray together? Lord and Father, thank you for this lesson. We have reminded us that you are the good shepherd. You care about us. Dear Lord, help us to recognize that because we have a good shepherd, we have nothing to fear, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Help us to remember that you have the best intentions about our lives. Help us to remember not to spend our energy fighting other people. Help us to live lives of victory, lives of joy. In your name we pray, amen.